Senator Feldman, we're live and ready to go. Okay, well, um, welcome to the Senate Finance Committee uh, today. Um, we are having a briefing on, an, I think, an important topic. In the last few years, the, the committee has um, done a lot on the clean energy space and essentially uh, energy policy comes within the jurisdiction of the committee. This year, um, you know, there's been some developments in this, in this uh, area, particularly the announcement of several closures of our coal-fired power plants in Maryland. One is in my Senate district, and then we, as recently as last week, uh, an announcement of additional closures. At the same time, there have been a lot of discussion about the workforce. You know, what happens to the workers at these facilities? So as we continue, as I think, as a country to transition away from fossil fuels to, towards clean energy, renewable energy, um, I think it's important for this committee to have a sense of what the impact of these changes are in Maryland. Um, and also, I think equally important, what is the impact on the, on the workforce? Um, and what do you do with the workers who've been displaced? So we've got, I think, two competing, very important topics that we hope to uh, touch on today. And the only final thing before we go to our first presenter is, um, if there is a change of administration come January 20th, um, the Biden, the incoming administration has talked about a pretty significant investment in the clean energy space. And so it's those states, I think, that can be positioned in terms of infrastructure and, and such will be the states that really benefit um, in a significant way in terms of federal investments. And so um, with that said, and with that background, um, I think our first presenter is David uh, Smedic uh, from the Sierra Club, uh, who is, I know, here. And David, um, Wherever you are, uh, you're going to be uh, our first witness for the day, and we've got a group of uh, panelists, and we'll just go one by one. And I think, um, as we've done in the past, um, if anybody, when each uh, person is done testifying, we'll I'll look for some raised hands. And Madam Chair, we can maybe alternate or whatever we want to handle uh, in terms of uh, kind of conducting the, the hearing here. But anybody has any questions, just raise your hand or pipe in yourself and we'll uh, we'll do it that way. So David, um, why don't you start off and, and tell us what uh, you want to contribute to uh, the discussion today? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair uh, and Madam Chair and members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today and all my colleagues as well uh, that are on the call talking about this important issue. Uh, as Nathan's bringing up the slides that we have here, uh, just really briefly again, uh, my name is David Smedic. I'm a senior campaign representative with the Sierra Club. Uh, based here in Maryland. I live in Baltimore and have been working with you all for a few years on responding to the climate crisis in this state, uh, particularly around the electricity sector and, and in many other spaces. And as Senator Feldman alluded to, we are seeing some really rapid changes in the electricity sector in particular uh, as, as relevant to this committee. Uh, and we wanted to, we're really appreciative of the opportunity to provide our insights and the way that we're looking at some things now. So uh, Nathan, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to be starting really, really big and then zeroing in a lot more on Maryland and particularly on the issue that Senator Feldman mentioned, the changing landscape of coal in, in Maryland. And this is a, a shift that's being experienced across the entire country. So looking at power generation by energy source uh, over the last 50 to 70 years, you're really seeing a pretty remarkable shift over the last 15 years of a decline in coal growth in gas, but also a pretty significant growth in renewables that we're starting to experience. And, we're, and as Maryland has passed additional legislation, we're going to be seeing that growth in renewables accelerated. Uh, so the next slide, Nathan. Uh, this is a, a wonky looking graph, but it is from the New York Times. They just actually came out with a pretty remarkable series on, uh, you can select each state in the nation and see that the, the change since 2000 in terms of their electricity generation scope. And you can see in Maryland, we're seeing an even more precipitous decline than that previous national uh, landscape when it comes to coal-fired power generation in particular. Uh, and you can see we are still uh, have a lot more work to do when it comes to solar, wind, and, and other renewables, uh, but they're starting to increase and the Clean Energy Jobs Act is gonna help with that process. Uh, but again, the, the, the changing landscape is pretty remarkable here, even over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and the next slide. So taking a, a closer look at what that means, uh, again, zeroing in, uh, especially on that changing landscape in coal, uh, 
Maryland, as, as we started 2020, uh, we had six coal-fired power plants that were operating in Maryland. Uh, you can see them there on the left. Uh, there's only five big dots, but that's because two of the plants are, are co-located very, very closely together uh, in the central part of the state in northern Anne Arundel County. But in Maryland, our, our decline in coal has been really significant. So we're seeing uh, an 80% drop since uh, around 2007 in terms of the electricity coming from the coal plants in Maryland. Uh, and we're seeing an even a steeper dip again in 2020. Uh, but it's still, despite that decline in operation, if you can go to the next slide, Nathan. Uh, the reason that we as an organization are so really interested in this is because frankly, it's still an outsized pollution contributor. Uh, and when we're looking at official numbers from the Department of the Environment, uh, in-state coal-fired power plants are still a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And we have state laws that are mandating a pretty significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. As the globe is facing a climate crisis and with 10, 20, 30 years to make all of our progress to net zero emissions, we have to be starting with coal because of its carbon intensity and because of the significant pollution contributions considering sulfur dioxide and nit smog forming nitrogen oxides. So with a declining uh, percentage of electricity output from the coal power, coal fired power plants in Maryland, they're still really, really big significant contributors when it comes to other pollutants and uh, climate disrupting carbon dioxide. So that's why it's still an important focus for us to be looking at how we're transitioning off this in a more responsible way. Uh, so the next slide, Nathan. Uh, so drilling in a little bit more specifically, as Senator Feldman alluded to, uh, and I, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, we had six coal-fired power plants still operating in Maryland at the start of 2020. Since the start of 2020, four of our six coal-fired power plants have either deactivated entirely or announced their plans to deactivate in the coming years. In May of 2020, the Dickerson Power Plant in Montgomery County announced that it was going to close just within 90 days. And in August of this year, it formally deactivated its coal generation. In August, again, uh, the Chalk Point Power Plant in Prince George's County announced that it was going to stop its coal operations in June of 2021. And then just last week, the owner of the Brandon Shores and Wagner Power Plants in Anne Arundel County said that by the mid-decade, they're going to stop their coal operations at those power plants as well. So this is rapidly, rapidly happening here in the state of Maryland but we're not fully locked in for moving off of the fuel entirely yet, as we know we need to be when it comes to the climate crisis and other public health issues. So on the, on the next slide, uh, we're seeing that start to coalesce, the, the shared recognition that the two remaining power plants in Maryland, we need to manage that transition. We need to know that they're going to stop burning coal for the sake of climate and public health. In Maryland's draft greenhouse gas reduction plan, from the Maryland Department of the Environment directly, their appendix on just transition, which I'll get to in a second here, cited exactly how you can do this transition off of a fossil fuel like coal in a more responsible way. It includes providing a timeline for the phase out of activities, creating worker transition support programs, providing oversight bodies, getting in touch with communities, and ensuring that that process is going to go better than what we've seen in the past, where large facilities and economic engines leave with little notice and with little planning. And this is hot off the presses, actually, the other part of the slide. Just today, uh, the Department of the Environment publicly released their Commission on Climate Change report. The Commission on Climate Change in Maryland is a uh, bipartisan body made up of state agencies, um, different industry and business leaders, environmental advocates, uh, labor advocates, et cetera. And one of the recommendations within that annual report was for the General Assembly to establish a timeline by no later than 2030 that we're gonna stop burning coal at our remaining power plants, and we're going to establish worker and transition program to support that process. So that was really interesting to see and really exciting to see that we're starting to move in the direction of better managing this transition in the energy sector. And my last slide anyway, Nathan, um, is exactly that. And I, I wanna spend a little bit of time here. I've burned through a lot of information, but what I really wanted to get across from the, the previous slides was this decline of the fossil fuel sector, particularly around coal and our electricity system is happening now. We need to better manage it. And we do that by establishing clear timelines by which we want it to happen and supporting the impacted stakeholders that are facing this transition. So we need to be looking at what are the real impacts? 
what are the jobs that are being, uh, you know, job displacement that's being faced by this? What are the communities that have been historically overburdened by pollution? What can we be doing to invest in the clean energy economy in those par parts of the state? We need to be uh, coordinating with local governments uh, on what the impacts for them are going to be. And most importantly, potentially, we need to be ensuring that beyond in the clean energy sector and beyond that we are creating high quality family supporting and union jobs right here in Maryland. The fossil fuel industry jobs are high quality, they're high wages. So what are we doing to make sure that as we're transitioning off jobs in the fossil fuel industry, in the clean energy economy and in other sectors of our economy, we are ensuring that we have high standards associated with jobs in that space. And we can look to other states that are, are moving in this direction as well. I'm happy to dive, dive into these in Q&A or other parts of the discussion around New York, Colorado, New Mexico, Washington, Arizona, and more are doing this kind of work where they are better managing the transition off of coal in particular and other fossil fuels and supporting workers and communities through that process as they're meeting the climate crisis goals that they've set through other laws like Maryland has. So I, I, that's, it was a lot again, but I only had 10 minutes. I think I hit it right on the nose about. Um, so I wanted to pause for discussion, question answers, or if Nathan or Senator Feldman, I'm transitioning to someone else, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity to dive into some heavy detail <laughs> at the moment. Okay, well, thank you, David, for that presentation. Yeah. Let me uh, toss the first question and then Senator Bottle uh, will have the next question. Great. So last year, we actually did have a, a bill in our committee, it was from yep. Senator West, dealing with a scheduled um, specific dates where uh, power coal-fired power plants yeah. were closed. We were mandating, in his bill, it was mandating closures. So how do you respond to folks? Because I understand you may be bringing a similar bill back. How do you respond to those who would say that, oh, look, these closures are taking place on their own. Mm -hmm. Economics is dictating that closure. And why would we need a bill um, yeah. uh, to do what's happening organically because of economic mm -hmm. factors? I, I just want to put that out there because that is you know, part of the discussion. Um, Absolutely. No, I, I completely understand. And I really appreciate that, that question. Uh, and I think th there's a few places that I would start. Um, as, as I noted in the slideshow, the Department of the Environment and the Commission on Climate Change have cited that to better manage this transition, you need to have timelines in place by which it's going to happen. So first and foremost, we've heard from the Department of the Environment's research and the Commission on Climate Change's research that the best way to start managing this is to know when it's going to happen at specific facilities, and then we can better plan for the process uh, by which we're gonna support workers and communities. Beyond that, uh, I really think that it's important for the certainty of our response to the, to the climate crisis and our various public health crises going on right now. Uh, you saw the pollution numbers that I put up there. That's just a part of, of the environmental impact of coal. And we need to know that we're gonna have cleaner air, that we're going to be meeting our Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act laws. And the way to do that, it's kind of climate action 101, if I'm being honest, you have to transition off of the coal fired power plants. So if we know that we have to do that as part of cleaning our electricity sector, we sure as heck better be managing it better and knowing when it's going to happen and supporting the people through the process that are gonna be impacted by that. Okay, Senator Bidel, um, you got you got the floor. Oh, I think I'm not sure if you're muted. We're not hearing you, uh, Pam. For whatever reason, we can't hear you. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Um, thank you, Senator Feldman. So, David, just a couple quick questions. Um, yeah. so other states, I'm sure, are going through similar transitions. What are they doing different? How are they handling this transition? Is there more yeah. that one can do? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I could go on and on for quite a while on that one, so I will be brief. But the, uh, just to highlight some of the other states that I mentioned, uh, in, in Colorado, for example, uh, they've established an entire office in their state government uh, of quote unquote just transition to evaluate the timing of uh, various facility closures and identifying additional funding resources uh, that can support the programs. What does it mean for an individual worker to get the support that they need through the process? Um, Washington State, as an example, did pass legislation to move entirely off of coal-fired power in the electricity sector and provide financial support for impacted workers and communities, and I'm happy to distribute that kind of legislation. 
Uh, similarly, in New York, um, they're constantly debating new language to create better and, and higher uh, quality jobs and union jobs in the clean energy sector through offshore wind, solar, et cetera. But New York State, just in, in a few years ago, also uh, through regulatory processes, ended coal burning in 2020 for them as well. So again, it's, it's about setting the timeline. Uh, a lot of those states, they're setting timelines by which they want to see this happen and then providing additional programs and funding in order to, uh, to make it work. So uh, um, again, I'll distribute additional legislative language and stuff from those other states, um, but, but happy to do that. Don't want to eat up the rest of the time from folks, but thank you. Um, Senator Feldman, can I have one other quick question? Absolutely, yes. David, you mentioned the Commission on Climate Change. Will we all get to see that report? Is that going to be reported back to the legislature? It should be, yes. And uh, I believe that MDE, if they haven't already, are, are planning to do that. Um, I, and, and Kim may be speaking to this, one of the uh, next uh, presenters. She, she's the co-chair of the commission, so she might have some additional information on that. Okay, Chair Kelly, you had a question. Hmm. You're muted, Madam Chair. Um, okay. So, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I know that labor can speak for itself, but yeah, I'm sure that you've got a uh, point of view as to what needs to be done so we are dealing with what is just and right mm -hmm. together. What, from your perspective, would you say needs to be done and what kind of timelines ought to be set in order uh, to have less disruption and more sure. just movement to clean energy from the perspective of labor? Absolutely, and, and I will uh, echo, I, I can't speak for labor. I'm excited to hear what they have to say. Um, I, I can speak to a, a little bit maybe from what Senator Bido was mentioning on, on what are other states looking at and what I think could be applicable here are uh, policies and, and, and funding mechanisms to help with um, uh, wage displacement benefits, health displacement benefits or wage gap benefits associated with that. So if you are facing uh, job loss or displacement in one sector and you're getting a job in another sector, is there a time period that you can be supported in any wage gap that, uh, that results by that process? Uh, can you be assisted in, in reallocation benefits as well? Um, and I think the healthcare piece is really important there too. And I think that the other thing that I'm, I'm looking at and the Sierra Club is looking at is how are we ensuring again, those high quality union jobs in our emerging industries? especially in the clean energy sector. How are we ensuring that we, we've done some work in that in the Maryland State Legislature on offshore wind, especially, but we need to get those projects built. We need to build more of them and we need to be sure that we're, we're doing it in other spaces. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, in, um, in that second part of it. It's not just about supporting folks that are facing job displacement, but it's about ensuring that the new jobs we're creating in the industry are supporting uh, workforce and families in that same way. Thank you. Let me ask one other thing. When we move, as we move eventually, we've taken too long to our offshore wind. Uh, I don't expect that there would be long-term jobs uh, paying wages comparable mm -hmm. to what many of the people coming from organized labor right now are getting in their old uh, industries. So what could we do that is sustainable for these folks uh, what else could we add to our clean energy portfolio once the basic infrastructure has been built in order to uh, have these workers have jobs that are meaningful and well-paying? Yeah, great, great question, Chairwoman. Uh, I will, again, be curious to hear from, from the labor folks directly on that and also from the other uh, clean energy industry folks uh, on the call coming up. But I think that's a really important question. We, we know that you don't employ the same number of folks at a solar farm as you do at a coal or gas fired power plant. Uh, so we need to start thinking about what are the operations and maintenance um, requirements for our new infrastructure. And I, I admit, I don't have all the answers to that. I think it's a really good question and, and um, we'll wanna hear from other folks on it, but I think it's the right question to be asking. Okay, we appreciate your presentation today. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions for Mr. Senator. Yes, Senator, oh, Senator, Senator Hershey, okay. Yes. Yes. Quick Senator question for David, Hershey. please. Yep. Thank you. Um, David, um, can you talk a little bit about what we saw that happened out in uh, California with some of the brownouts that have kind of been attributed to this same movement towards the intermittent 
uh, energy generation and, and, and away from the reliable energy sources, especially when it comes to the capacity market and the, and the times of peak demand. Um, just can you speak about what happened there and, 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 and if we are, you know, moving in a direction that would, you know, pre- prevent that from happening or allow that to happen? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Um, I, I will admit I need to go back and review all the stuff that specifically happened in California, but I can speak to it a little bit more uh, locally, both in Maryland and in PJM. And I think some other folks should probably chime in in their presentations as well. But uh, PJM, uh, our, our grid operator, one of their first and foremost and primary uh, responsibilities is to make sure that we have reliable power and we're not facing those brownouts. Uh, so that, that responsibility with, with PJM is really critically important. And I think that we've seen uh, in some of the uh, reports that they've put out in terms of evaluating their capacity market and their capacity performance markets is during some of the polar vortex events, we actually had a lot of fossil fuel facilities that could not come online and operate uh, during that time period. So I think that it's uh, because of a variety of issues, because of they were you know uh, up for maintenance at certain points or because it was just too cold and the coal piles froze or something like that. So that, that point of um, you know, different power sources and how they respond during different weather events is um, you know, a really interesting question, but I think that it, it, it goes beyond um, just talking about the, the sun shining and the wind blowing. I think there's a lot of different species of that, and I bet that David, and, uh, David Murray with MDVC and others can speak to it a little bit more, but um, I think that that's part of the reason that we need to start planning for this, uh, this transition process a heck of a lot more and understanding when our, res- our fossil resources are going to be going offline so that we can be ensuring that the grid is, is ready for it. I, I will note, uh, and, the, and then I'll leave it, um, I'll stop talking, but the PJM grid operator evaluated both the Dickerson power plant closures from the summer and the anticipated uh, deactivation of Chalk Point. And in both instances, they found that there, there were no reliability concerns with those facilities going offline. So uh, they, they could go off as scheduled. So I think that PGM is there to do that reliability analysis. They'll let us know okay. uh, what the details are. Okay, great. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing that because I, I think if I understand California was, was more during the summer months when the concerns uh, were, were out there rather than the colder months. But um, okay, I'd just be happy to hear what, what PJM says about you know, this, because as I understood that these coal fire facilities that we're talking about were really just peakers that were coming on at very limited times. Um, but again, that that type of um, supplier is essential to our, our demand market. And I just want to make sure that we have someone who's taking a look at that. Understood. Thank Happy you. to follow up with you about it, Senator. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any additional questions from Mr. Smedic. So thank you, David, for your presentation. We're going to go to the Next um, witness, Kim Koval from Maryland League of Conservation Voters, which, uh, as I understand also, you uh, was just referenced, you're the co-chair of the commission that was just mentioned by Mr. Smedic. Uh, so Kim, um, I do see you and you can proceed uh, however you see fit. Great, thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. I'm Kim Coble. I'm the Executive Director for the Maryland League of Conservation Voters, and it's great to see some of my friends there. I am also co-chair of the Maryland Commission on Climate Change. And um, before I talk about that report, I wanted to let you know that recently Maryland LCD uh, underwent a strategic planning process. In fact, we're putting the final touches on it. And we have identified climate change as the most urgent environmental threat facing people in our planet. Um, our, the main focus of our work over the next several years will be centered on equitable laws and policies to address climate change impacts in Maryland. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today with um, uh, over 3,100 miles of shoreline in Maryland Uh, We're particularly vulnerable to sea level rise, and we need to continue to be a national leader in fighting climate change. And um, I think this committee's discussion is really an important part of it. The World Resources Institute recently conducted a study of all 50 states' uh, CO2 emissions and their economic growth between 2005 and 2017. WRI found that 41 out of 50 states have grown their economies while reducing their uh, carbon dioxide emissions. 
They also noted that Maryland cut CO2 emissions 37.6% in that time period, more than any other state, while simultaneously growing the state's economy by 17.7%. The main point I'm making here is that this data highlights the reality that we can implement bold climate change policies and grow our economy at the same time. Um, let's see here. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide and um, thank you. So uh, as David mentioned, uh, it was actually released last Friday, the Maryland Commission on Climate Change submitted its an annual report to the Maryland General Assembly and the governor. I, I will share the website with uh, Nathan to get make sure that everybody has access to it. As background, the commission is made up of four working groups, the Adaptation and Resiliency Working Group, the Education and Communications and Outreach Working Group, the Science and Technical Working Group, and the Mitigation Work Group. The annual report provides a whole series of recommendations from each of these work groups to enhance the state's efforts on climate change mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. And this year, there's also recommendations specifically to better incorporate environmental and climate justice into our approach and more meaningfully engage with disadvantaged and overburdened communities. Uh, next slide. The recommendations from the mitigation work group of which I am a co-chair of that um, pertain to reduction, emission reduction goals, the transportation sector, the building sector, natural and working lands and the electricity sector. And there are numerous recommendations presented in this report. And I should also mention that uh, the report was adopted unanimously with one uh, abstentia by the entire commission on climate change. So there's a lot of support from a wide diverse uh, group of folks. Um, today, I'm gonna touch on four of the nine recommendations that were specific, specifically pertaining to the electricity sector. Uh, the next slide, please. The first recommendation I want to highlight pertains to the state's overall reduction goals. The recommendation is to adopt a more ambitious greenhouse reduction goal requiring 50% 50 reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. This is up um, from the goal that was set in 2016 of a 40% reduction. And we're also recommending uh, the state set a long range goal, uh, which is actually in my mind, even more important. The goal is to develop plans to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. And the 2045 goal is consistent with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC um, recommendations for developed countries. So we would be right where we're supposed to be according to the international uh, IPCC. Next slide. Recommendations specific to the electricity sector. The General Assembly should set forth a 100% clean energy by 2040 plan to ensure that Maryland's electricity is made up of electricity with zero or net zero carbon emissions, and that it is focused on providing benefits of clean energy to overburdened and underserved communities first. This is a really significant recommendation that will help us to continue to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while building our economy. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear from uh, other folks, the other colleagues on the call here, um, but there's tremendous growth potential in renewable energy sector and as well as environmental and social benefits associated with transforming to clean energy. And we support this recommendation because the, of the priority um, placed on clean energy, but we also support it because of the priority it placed on helping overburden and underserved communities, which undoubtedly are disproportionately affected from um, pollution and climate change. Next slide. The General Assembly should establish a clear enforceable schedule to responsibly manage Maryland's transition off its remaining coal-fired power plants by no later than 2030 and replace the capacity with equivalent non-coal-fired power and the creation of a workforce and community transition plan to support laid off workers in impacted communities. David discussed this, but I wanna more specifically mention this again because it is so important um, that not only are we talking about transitioning off of coal, but we are talking about replacing it 
with clean energy and ensuring that there's a workforce and community transition plan put in place. So this is a very comprehensive recommendation and again, received unanimous support from the um, committee. Uh, slides, the next one. Maryland should develop a three-pronged incentive approach to utility, commercial, and residential scale battery storage, consisting of upfront rebates, performance incentives, and access to low-cost financing. And Nathan, if you can go to the next slide as well. Maryland should continue to increase storage capacity and deploy other grid improvements to facilitate the use and dependability of renewably sourced generation. In the report, there are several recommendations that pertain to battery storage and grid modernization. And I wanna highlight these issues because storage and grid improvements are critical components to moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy. There are a number of considerations that need to be made, including co-benefits, reliability, cost, decarbonization potential, and technological advancements. It will take leadership from the PSC and the Maryland Energy Administration. It'll take incentives and research, but as David's pointed out, we're not alone. There's other states that are working in this area as well. Um, so the next slide. Um, I just want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak with you. I think this is a really critical, urgent issue and I applaud the committee for addressing it. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Chair welcome. Kelly, did you, I, I didn't know if you could, you know, reassert, uh, you can present. No, go ahead. You're doing a great well, job. Okay, fair much. enough. I've got a question from Senator Hayes. So, Senator Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, a lot of the conversation that we've had today has really been about the jobs associated um, with the industry. I wonder if there's been any conversation or any Thing that you could point to in other states as it relates to equity and inclusion as far as diversity in the um, generators of clean energy that Maryland should be considering? Thank you, Senator. That's a really important question. Um, and I, the answer is yes, there's a lot of conversations going on um, around the uh, importance of community outreach, diversity in the job sectors and, and how to address these. Uh, I know that there's a number of bills being discussed that would start to look at those impacts. In the Climate um, Commission report, there's a new section actually on the climate justice and environmental justice that also addresses it. So um, I can't speak to the specifics, but I will uh, roundly say that there's tremendous amount of conversation and discussion going on around that. No, thank you. And I think that would be helpful. And I'll, I'll take a look at a closer look. But what I'm definitely interested in um, more so, not so much as jobs, but ownership in a clean industry sector and what opportunities as far as inclusion exist there. Oh, I apologize. Um, I bet my uh, the folks that are speaking after me will be able to address that better than I can. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Cobo. Okay, seeing none, thank you, Kim, for, for that presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going to go to our next panelist. Uh, we've got David Murray from the Chesapeake Solar and Storage Association, and that's a new name for the organization. David, I don't know what uh, prompted the uh, change in the title or the name of, of your organization, but in any event, welcome, and you are the executive director of, um, of this association. So, Coming from a solar uh, point of view, um, I'll turn it over to you. And I know you've got a presentation, a slide presentation as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Senator Feldman and uh, Chairwoman Kelly. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, my name is David Murray. I serve as executive director of the Chesapeake Solar and Storage Association. Um, we were formerly MDVCA, um, the Maryland DC Virginia Solar Energy Industries Association. If you did not know, that's what we were beforehand. Uh, that was one of the reasons why we changed it. Uh, you can only have so many letters. Um, and so we represent the Solar and Energy Storage Association of Virginia, Maryland, and DC. 
um, and occasionally Delaware as well. So we really wanted to rebrand to something that, that fit the region that we serve, uh, but also that a number of our members are working in energy storage. Uh, whether you're utility scale or you work with customers, homeowners, uh, farms, uh, businesses that want to go off grid, uh, that really reflects the, the members we serve. And so I'll also be joined by Cyrus Tashkori, uh, who's the chairman of the Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition of Maryland, um, which is a partner of, of CHESA uh, in, in the state. Next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly talk about solar deployment in 2020 and how COVID has impacted uh, the solar industry. I'll also talk about what's holding back uh, the solar industry, uh, despite the passage of the Maryland Clean Energy Jobs Act uh, last year, and offer some solutions as uh, to these challenges as specifically as they relate to permitting. But first, uh, Senator Hayes, you, you raised a really interesting question around equity and, and I wanna make sure we address that. So, so I wanna talk about it now. Um, equity and solar ownership is, is something that's really fundamental uh, to the industry. And there's a number of efforts that uh, seek to address that. One of which is the Maryland Community Solar Program uh, where 30% of the community solar programs are, are uh, focused towards customers that are low to moderate income. Um, and there are also uh, initiatives like grid alternatives and civic works that try to address the workforce element of the solar industry. But I, I think what's really poignant and something that we as a solar industry are also trying to address is how do we um, provide solar to, to what I call the missing middle. Uh, folks that have um, very high credit or the capital to put solar on their roof are obviously uh, are, are able to participate. And those that qualify for the low to moderate income community solar program also are, are able to access solar energy. But what if you don't necessarily have the cash to put down a, a down payment on a system or your, your credit score might not be um, able to access a PPA? Um, and so we've made a couple of recommendations to the MEA as to how they could revise their grant program to really access um, would also call a sort of middle class, uh, lower middle class uh, homeowner in order to provide them solar. And, and I'm happy to follow up with your office as well as to um, low to moderate income access, but also workforce development, because I think these are really important initiatives um, that historically the solar industry has not uh, done a strong job of, of taking on. And, and it's certainly a, a very strong industry priority moving forward. And I know that uh, in the the uh, new Biden-Harris administration will, will certainly be interested in pursuing that at a federal level, and we hope to pursue that at, at the state level as well. Next slide, please. So next, I, I wanna show uh, solar deployment year by year. Now this is just small projects. So these are generally rooftop projects. Um, and this is the amount of solar that's been deployed each quarter in Maryland. Um, over the course of years. And you'll see that we really haven't gotten back to 2016 levels. And uh, we've been doing anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 megawatts uh, every quarter, which we really need that to be above 60 in order to meet our goals set about in the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So uh, again, I'll, I'll get into those in a minute, but I just wanna give you all an overview of where the solar industry is uh, over the course of the last couple of years in terms of meeting our targets set about in the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Next slide, please. So um, as the chart suggests, why have not we been able to return to 2016 levels? And um, in 2018, federal tariffs were imposed on solar panels, steel, steel and aluminum. Uh, those certainly affected a lot of the larger projects, but they also did have a small impact on the residential and commercial side as well. Again, following the Clean Energy Jobs Act, the SREC market has remained stable um, but because of the ratepayer impact priorities of the Clean Energy Jobs Act to really ensure that it did not yield a greater than $2 uh, a month ratepayer impact, they, they were really moderately priced. Um, so there wasn't really a national gold rush created where you had a lot of out-of-state installers coming in and setting up office. Rather, the local installers uh, that the Chesapeake Solar and Storage Association represents uh, had, had a much better workable market. You saw the commercial industry start to come back before COVID-19. Uh, folks, business was certainly picking back up, but it, it wasn't creating this uh, dramatic rush um, if CJA would have 
created a, a much higher abstract market, which again, we didn't want to do because we didn't want to impose that rate payer impact. So the next two factors that I want to discuss are, are COVID-19 and permitting challenges. So you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, in terms of COVID-19, so obviously when the pandemic really hit in March, uh, no one wanted to have anywhere one near their house. There was a lot of uncertainty over the financial uh, markets and what folks' jobs look like. Um, but then uh, as the year went on, we started uh, determining how uh, we could install solar safely in socially distant manner. Uh, the residential market has come back. Um, my residential installers report that, that things are good right now, especially as folks try to get in um, with the investment tax credit early. Commercial projects tell the opposite story. Uh, while the pandemic hit in the spring, uh, the projects under construction kept our workforce employed. Now, because of so much uncertainty in the commercial real estate market, things are really at a lull right now. And so those, those larger projects that we might see on, on commercial buildings um, or the mush market, uh, things are really stalling. Uh, but we, we do want to commend Governor Hogan for ensuring that our industry could continue operating as essential workers, uh, as critical infrastructure. One of the, the nice things about the solar industry is it's, it's able to be done um, outdoors and socially distant. So next slide, please. Nonetheless, um, there has been a key permitting challenge that has come up in 2020 as a number of Maryland counties adopt a new residential code. Um, this mandates a larger fire setback on residential installations, meaning there, has, there, there needs to be fewer space um, that solar panels can be placed on a roof. So if you go to the next slide, I can show you exactly what I mean by that. So originally without these fire setback codes, um, a installer could put panels on both the red and the blue portions of the house. But because of these new setbacks, uh, there's a lot fewer, there's a lot less space that folks can work with. And so the solar industry is trying to address this at a county level. Uh, we're working with Montgomery County, which is one of the first counties to implement these setbacks uh, to create a variance that would exempt us. But it's our goal that this becomes something that's statewide that balances the need for both um, fire protection, but also the need to ensure that we're not um, minimizing the amount of solar panels we put on roofs. So you can go on to the next slide. And also, we uh, just I just want to say, too, that permitting challenges are still an issue, obviously, with things uh, moving to uh, during the, the pandemic, folks really struggled with uh, getting uh, their permits back in time. There is inconsistent revision cycles. Uh, a number of dated practices like paper re application requirements has certainly created a number of hiccups. Um, I was glad to see that these issues were uh, brought up in the governor's citing report, especially um, given uh, the, the importance of counting at the permitting level. So next slide, please. And so finally, uh, this is the number of things that we're trying to do at the uh, permitting and inspection level um, to really address um, and meet some of these best practices shown by Harford and Howard counties, uh, which are really leaders in this uh, space. So next, I'm gonna turn it over to Cyrus Tashkori to talk about the utility scale. So you can move on to um, the next slide and, and he'll discuss a little bit of the challenges at the, the large scale projects. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Cyrus Tashikori, Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition. Uh, the utility scale segment of Maryland's industry is really rearing to get to work in Maryland, but facing some significant uh, permitting headwinds. Uh, in the 2019 perennial ruling, the Court of Special Appeals in Maryland affirmed that the PSC has ultimate siting authority over utility scale solar projects. Uh, Perennial also stated the local governments have an important voice in the CPCN process, but that their role is a participant in that process. Um, despite Perennial, PPRP has essentially given local governments a veto over solar CPCNs. And really just to be perfectly straightforward with you, that local veto will guarantee that Maryland will not get close to achieving its in-state goals by 2030. Uh, despite CJA, utility scale solar permitting is currently at a crawl. Um, there were eight permits granted in 2018, two in 2019, and only one in 2020. And what's at stake here is really best articulated by a recent report um, by the Economist at the Center for Climate Strategies. They looked at this really narrow issue of utility scale solar permitting and found that if Maryland removes barriers to utility scale solar permitting, we would increase new direct local investment in Maryland by over $400 million 
and increase wages by over uh, $340 million over the next 10 years. Next slide, please. Um, the good news is that the PSC and members of the General Assembly and even PPRP are already working on solutions. There's a reform effort at the PSC to improve the CPCN structure, to increase transparency, and to increase local government participation in the process. There's also legislation that's being proposed that would require that PPRP share certain analysis with the PSC uh, for each application, which is currently not uh, required or clear under the law. Um, but in conclusion, what, you know, what can this committee do? Two specific items. One, this committee could help clarify that once a CPCN has been granted at the state level, that it can't be vote, uh, vetoed by the, at the local level. And number two, this committee can also help ensure that once the PSC has imposed licensing conditions, setbacks, screening, decommissioning requirements, et cetera, on a project that local governments can't sub, uh, subsequently change those conditions. And these changes in conjunction with other efforts that are already underway will really help uh, the current permitting dynamic while ensuring that the, lo the local voice is heard as part of that CPCN process. Thank you very much. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Cyrus. So any questions for either uh, David Murray or, or Cyrus solar industry related um, where our solar industry is in Maryland or where it's going? Any questions from anybody? Okay, I'm looking through. I don't see anybody's hand raised. So thank you, uh, appreciate that. Uh, excellent presentation. Senator Feldman. Oh, we've got Senator Hershey. Senator Hershey. Yeah, you're on the phone, so I don't see your hand raised, but Senator Hershey. Yeah, my, my apologies. I'm on my phone. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Cyrus, just a couple of quick questions for you. Um, obviously, you know, again, and, and you know we've had this conversation before. I, I uh, represent uh, four rural counties, and um, many of the counties feel that they are taking on the burden to reach our renewable energy goals when it comes to utility scale solar projects. Um, and I mean, that's surely just by the, the acreage uh, required to do some of these projects. Um, and it always gets brought up to me, you know, how much of, 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 of the share of, of utility scale solar is going out into these counties as opposed to other counties. Um, I, I, I know you mentioned what Howard County and, and Hartford County are doing. I'm not sure if that's related to utility scale projects or not, but maybe maybe you could reference that. Um, but also I, I know that Montgomery County has been in the news um, with their agricultural corridor and um, what might be able to uh, occur in that area as well. Um, if you could maybe dis discuss those two issues. And then finally, um, because we are talking so much about um, jobs. Can you kind of go over a little bit about um, what the employment status looks like for a utility scale solar project? Um, you know, how many people are on site? How long they're on site? Where are these people coming from? And then once one of these projects are done, are there any other ancillary jobs that, um, that come along after um, related to the to the installation of that project. Sure, okay. Senator Hershey, thank you for the questions. Um, I'll take that last one first. The profile of a utility scale solar project, like many kind of infrastructure type of jobs, real estate market, uh, real estate construction included, um, is front end loaded. A lot of jobs, a, a massive number of jobs up front, and then um, a large long term kind of tax base impact on the economy. Uh, after that. So similar to commercial, residential, you know, uh, bridges and roads, um, you know, the expectation is over the next decade, the same several thousand folks would be employed going from one large project to the next one, just like Maryland's construction industry, you know, currently operates. Um, a lot of those jobs are, uh, in fact, as many as is, is feasible, uh, uh, as there is interest is, is uh, provided by the local communities. Um, and they're, you know, many of them are construction jobs and, and um, don't require particular expertise. Uh, although, you know, it, over the next decade, you would see uh, a specialization among the construction industry that would be in, based in Maryland going from one project to the next 
in an ideal world. Obviously, we're trying to get there with uh, with the permitting regime in, in the state. Um, regarding sorry, your question, real quick on real quick on that because you spoke of the of the um, construction. Sorry to interrupt, but just because you spoke of the construction to, and related it to the construction. It, and, and I saw something earlier that David had mentioned about federal tariffs that were applied. Are, are we manufacturing any solar panels um, in the United States, or are we still relying on uh, overseas production of panels? Sure. The largest manufacturer in the world is in Ohio, um, also has an office in Arizona. We don't manufacture panels in Maryland, but... Um, First Solar, uh, which uh, I think you're familiar with them, are uh, is a sure. is the largest fit manufacturer. There are other manufacturers in the U.S. It is a global market, just like a lot of different you know industries that are active in Maryland. The the um, supplies come from all over the world. Okay, thanks. No problem. And I'll just briefly. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but answer the. Uh, you're, you're you're correct that a uh, you know something between sixty and seventy percent of the solar projects in Maryland end up on the Eastern shore. Um, you know, some counties on the Eastern shore really look at this as a very unique economic uh, development opportunity. The good news and the bad news, I guess, depending on how you look at it, is there are very, very few actual locations across Eastern shore or across Maryland where you can actually develop a solar farm. It has to do with the perfect, you know, crossing over of transmission capacity, transmission infrastructure, and land and the economics. So, even in you know the the the, the uh, counties that host the most solar farms, um, less than ninety. I mean, more than ninety-five percent of the land in the county is ineligible for participation, and the remainder it's, it's not a guarantee that any of that works. It's just you know uh, it, it, I think there's a, a perception that you're going to see the county paved in solar, and that's just not a practical uh, reality. Right. Well, let me then let me ask a follow up to that. Um, you know, if, if if certain areas really could not um, handle a, a a solar project for various reasons, including the uh, the economics of it, ha have we created then a, a goal through our RPS that is that is not achievable if we look at it from from that perspective, or could you, in a sense, your industry? you know, um, come up with a map and say, you know, hey, here's exactly where we need to put these projects in order to meet our goal. Because sometimes as policymakers, we, we will, you know, focus more on the goal and the, and the uh, environmental attributes or the intent of what we're doing, but not necessarily recognizing can we actually achieve that or not. So can you kind of respond to that a little bit? Sure, and this was a big part of the conversation we had as part of the passage of CJ. Is this an achievable goal? And really, right. what what we're what we're here to say is, you know, we have everything we need. The policies are in place. The permitting um, regime is really slamming on the brakes. There's fuel in the car. We're ready to step on the gas. We need the traffic cop to, you know, get the memo so that we can actually develop these projects. And they're the same volume of projects we projected when we were talking about the Clean Energy Jobs Act, you know, last year and the year before, um, you know, they actually are in the PJM queue. You could even, you know, download the queue and look at them today. So it's, it's really not a matter of, is it feasible? It's a matter of, can we uh, improve the permitting regime, the state permitting regime, which should be working well, if not for, uh, you know, a couple of, couple of issues that, that are obstructing the process so that we can get to resolution on, these projects one way or the other. Right. But Cyrus, you mentioned that 60 to 70 percent of the projects were on the eastern shore. Or, I mean, extrapolating that out, are you saying that in order to meet our jobs, we have to keep that type of percentage of 60 to 70 percent of the utility scale projects out on the eastern shore in order to reach those goals? Yeah, I think the, the answer to where will these projects be located, it's it's safe to say that 60, 70% of them either are already permitted on the Eastern shore or will be, they're certainly in the PJM queue and you can you know, see where they're being proposed. Many of them are in the permitting process. Some of them have their permits already. So the answer is you know, the, the 2000 or so megawatts that add up to what 
uh, you know, what we projected as the 2030 volume of solar, 70% of that's on the Eastern shore and or 60, 70%. And again, you could drive from Annapolis to Ocean City without seeing a single solar farm. So really, you know, it, it, it's a tiny percentage of ag land of the Eastern shore. Uh, so just to put it in perspective, it's not, um, it sounds like a lot when you say 70% of all yeah. the solar, but when you consider it's less than 1% of ag land, you know, in the state, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a different story. I understand. Okay, thank you. I look forward to working with you some more on, on trying to Thanks, nail sir. down some of that, Cyrus. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Senator Thomas. Okay, thank you, Senator Hershey. Chair Kelly, I see your hand raised. Yes. Um, I'm interested in knowing where else other than on the Eastern Shore in Maryland, would, from a geological perspective, it makes sense to look at uh, possible permitting goals and, and to uh, w w w if, if much of the Eastern Shore is geologically not even per permittable, if I can create that term, where could we go from just a geological perspective? And should we have a map of where those areas are, uh, which help to guide where the uh, investment and the energy and, and the permitting would go? Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the issue is, is really not one of um, land or geology. It really comes down to transmission capacity and the transmission infrastructure. But just backing up, I'll just say the CPCN process is fully equipped to explore all of these issues, some of which are highly technical, and to make a, 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 to weigh the pros and cons and to make a, a decision on the public benefit or not of a proposed project. And uh, it's very challenging to translate this into a map or into you know a more prescriptive policy, but the, the process itself is extremely robust. The Public Service Commission has the technical expertise to make these decisions. There's a lot of local input already in the process and we're trying to increase that. So really it's not a matter of feasibility. We just want the process to be tweaked so that it can work the way it's supposed to work. But there are some um, natural uh, benefits if then um, you've got what transmission lines already, uh, in an area. So when you think about transmission lines, if that's an important variable, what would uh, you suggest would be the two or three counties or the areas of the state where it would make sense to work uh, to begin um, focusing uh, with that in mind? Yeah, if, 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 um, if I could wave a magic wand and build, do a solar farm right in the middle of Montgomery County, that would be the best place to inject electricity. Obviously, that's not feasible for a variety of reasons. It's urban, you know, dense urban area. Um, but those are kind of the, the challenges that as developers, we try to triangulate many, many variables to try to find so, feasible sites. Yep. So I can see you're having to deal with people variables and also with natural science variables. I'm trying to find out what in terms of the configuration from a geological or a transmission perspective uh, would make sense if we were committed to doing what we ought to be doing. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question because it, there is a lot of technical analysis involved. And I could, for example, generate a map for Senator Hershey today that a year from now, those sites would no longer have transmission capacity because it's a fluid situation. It's a fluid grid. And um, it and really hard to explain in this in this context, but you know that if you can imagine kind of that being a, a statement of fact that gives you an idea of how hard it is to, you know, to try to decide upfront um, where we should put these solar projects when we're beholden to the grid, the transmission system, and that is is very fluid. And there's federal regulation involved, there's state policy, obviously, all kinds of variables. And if we want private citizens and companies that exist in Maryland to have an equity position in these projects so that you have the resources from that perspective, we do need to be able to tell people where it makes sense to go. You sound like there are a lot of constraints that aren't necessarily people constraints, but natural science constraints of various kinds. So 
Are we working on some way of making that intelligible uh, for people that would want to be involved in this industry and to counties that have to consider when somebody comes up asking for a permit to do something, what makes sense? Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention the segment I'm specifically talking to is several dozen projects. Um, the commercial and even the community solar, which are hundreds of smaller projects all over the state, um, have a different level of regulation. They're not subject to PSC regulation. There is a whole you know, business model around and, and the regulations allow for subscription or participation in those projects. So there's a whole nother universe versus the- Okay, you know, but the you wedge. did say uh, that we need utility scale solar projects. We aren't just talking about the little ones. I won't go on, but if you could get back to us, so get with your colleagues and think about that. You know, we can't even suggest what would make good policy or what we ought to set as, as the operational goals until we understand some of that. And you brought up some important variables that I hadn't been particularly thinking about. I was thinking about people as maybe impediments, basically. And um, it would be helpful if you could tell us about natural science and commercial and other kinds of impediments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll follow up with you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see any additional questions. So thank you, Cyrus, and also to David Murray on behalf of the, the solar folks. Um, and let's move on, not to be outdone by the solar folks. We've got uh, Liz Burdock, President and CEO of the Business Network for Offshore Wind. And then after Liz, we have um, a group of folks representing labor, and we'll, we'll, we'll go there next. But uh, Liz, um, I know you're here somewhere. Do you see me? Oh, there you are. There I we go. See you. Okay, so you were going to talk about offshore wind a little bit. I sure uh, am. So uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, and all the members of the committee for including offshore wind in your briefing today. We, I am thrilled to be here. I'm probably one of the lesser known entities for all of you, but the Business Network for Offshore Wind is a Maryland-based national nonprofit. Uh, we focus on building out the U.S. offshore wind market and its supply chain. And I am actually very proud to say that we are the largest global nonprofit solely, solely focused on offshore wind with more than 340 members. If you weren't, offshore wind news wasn't coming into your inbox over the summer, you may have missed the fact that we actually have our first offshore wind project in federal waters. This is a picture of the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project just south of us in the Virginia Wind Energy Area. It was built during the summer uh, and was on time, on budget. Uh, we uh, had no problems with COVID-19 getting this project installed and it's now producing electricity to the grid as of I think last week. So that was a major accomplishment for the offshore wind industry. If you could go to the next slide. Um, so now we have two projects operating in the waters in the United States, but a lot has changed since I worked with some of you uh, in 2013 to pass MOWIA in the U.S. offshore wind industry, and even, even from the time that the PSC awarded the two projects in Maryland. Uh, we now have states committed to procuring more than 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, uh, and we have a uh, 9.1 gigawatts of offshore wind that have received a financial mechanism, either a PPA or an OREC. Uh, and those projects are from essentially Virginia all the way to Massachusetts. We also, we also have our first floating offshore wind project up in Maine. Uh, it received a hundred million dollar investment uh, from a private utility in Germ uh, Germany. Can you move to the next slide, please? Um, all of these projects that I just talked about are in what we call the BOEM permitting phase. Um, they are, they're in the siting and permitting uh, phase of offshore wind. They're actually in this construction and operations uh, area. And we have 10 COPs is what we call them at the BOEM level uh, that are under review right now. There's a queue. Uh, unfortunately, BOEM has delayed the approval process. So our COPs are all backed up 
Um, I should say that Skipjack does have its COP in. It's number four in line. U.S. Wind submitted their COP this summer, so it's probably nine or ten. I'm not sure exactly where it falls. We're hoping with the new Biden administration that we get this process moving much more quickly uh, than what we have seen in the past, and we can reduce the time of the permitting process from 10 years, which is what it's taking right now, to between about five, hopefully, three to five. So we will see. If you could go to the next slide, please. Despite this delay, um, we've seen unprecedented uh, investment in the offshore wind industry. Uh, just last quarter, we had $1 billion invested in offshore wind from BP when they became an equity partner in a New York lease. We've also um, been tracking the supplier contracts that have been awarded. Uh, this is a picture of our latest product at the Business Network. It's our offshore wind market dashboard because we track everything that goes on even by down to projects. So if you're interested in specifically what's happening in the Skipjack or the US Wind project, I can certainly give you that information. But we had 320 supplier contracts so far that have been given out in the offshore wind industry. Can you go to the next slide? We're seeing port infrastructure investment, again, from Virginia to Massachusetts. Uh, we have New Jersey has put $200 million into a, a super wind port, manu manufacturing port. Uh, New York, not to be outdone by New Jersey, has also uh, put $200 million into port infrastructure as well. We currently have Trade Point Atlantic under uh, construction going through some modernization to be ready as the staging site for the Skipjack project. So that construction is occurring right now. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is the points of interconnection. Um, I wanted to share this with you because uh, really for the, the next slide, this is the next big area of work in the offshore wind industry. It will be on construction, on-site construction work. So the onshore substations will um, be the, the piece that the developers will be focusing on. They don't want to leave their assets out there stranded. So they want to make sure that this onshore substation is, is completed. Can you go to the next slide? This is actually a list of businesses and well, services and then jobs that will need to be done at the this, this onshore substation. Uh, this was actually given to us by Skipjack when they did a supplier day. Uh, I think it was last, last year about this time. Uh, unfortunately, that project, their onshore substation has been delayed because they have to find a new point of interconnection. But we should see this, um, the call for workers and companies to be subcontractors uh, early next year, I would imagine. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is a CTV. Uh, these are specially built uh, crew transfer vessels that will be used in the offshore wind industry to support the level of development that we have on the East Coast. We will need 50 of these. This is the second one that was built for the sea valve project uh, down south. Uh, this is an area where we will need training, we'll need mariners in order to operate these uh, vessels. We'll also see the shipbuilding in Maryland. I expect us to at least get two, if not four CTVs built in Maryland out of the 50. Can you go to the next slide? This is the other big vessel that we will need in the offshore wind industry. It's a service operation vessel or work, walk to work vessel. It will hold 20 to 30 technicians out at sea for two weeks on, two weeks off. Uh, we will need eight of those. This is the first one that will be developed for the offshore wind market. Can you go to the next slide? GE has been selected as the turbine supplier for Skipjack. Uh, prior to uh, the delay in the interconnection and the, the delay at Bohm, we were getting ready to hold a supplier day for GE. These are the types of workers that they will be looking for. Uh, so these, uh, and the average price uh, or the average um, salary for these types of workers is about $51,000. Can you turn it to the next slide, please? 
Um, health and safety is an important piece of offshore wind. Uh, it's the health and safety culture is very valued in, in our industry. And I'm really proud to say that we now have a health and safety training facility on the Eastern shore uh, that will provide a global wind uh, uh, health and safety certification to workers that will be working on Maryland projects or any other project up and down the East Coast. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is our training. It's foundation to blade. Um, I'm again proud to say that the Maryland Energy Administration has supported us in delivering this training. We will be delivering it uh, four times in the state of Maryland to businesses to help them figure out where they specifically fit into the offshore wind industry, uh, to help them develop business plans and give them uh, pathways for diversification. We'll be doing outreach specifically to MBEs and WBEs. And can you go to the next slide? So this is another product that we have, which is our supply chain registry. These are the businesses in Maryland that have self-identified that are either working or want to work in offshore wind. And I can say that we will need training um, as it relates to composites, welding, mariners, I talked about that earlier, estimators, cybersecurity and IT. So even if you're not located next to the water, there are jobs in the middle of the state and even Western Maryland um, as it relates to ROVs and drone pilots that can be, um, that we can train up and use in the offshore wind industry. For the number of gigawatts that we have in our pipeline, Europe now supports 40,000 workers uh, with that, with similar um, cap uh, capacity installed, and they are struggling right now for workers. And I expect us, when the pipeline uh, comes on from the permitting process at the federal level, I expect us to be in the same position. In fact, we had a job fair in August. We were one of the only industries to have a job fair, and we are planning on having another one in February because we just can't find enough workers in the offshore wind industry. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Liz, uh, for that presentation. That was actually very good. Uh, I, we do have a question from Senator Kramer. Senator Kramer. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Liz, good to see you. And just so the committee understands, uh, Liz has been at this for years and has been working very hard to get Maryland's nascent offshore wind program going. Um, at this point, Liz, where does Maryland stand in the big picture of offshore wind? I know you know, seven years ago, we were in the forefront of maybe being a major player on the Atlantic coast uh, and, you know, had hopes of turning the uh, port of Baltimore into a major hub for, you know, job creation and construction of uh, offshore wind up and down the uh, East Coast. Um, are we even a player at this point or have other states taken over and we're just kind of static? So unfortunately, other states have taken over. Um, we, we, our commitment pales in comparison to other states. I mean, New York has 9,000. New Jersey has, I believe it's... Um, might be 6,000 now. Um, Massachusetts is thinking of increasing their commitment to 6,000. I mean, Virginia has 5,200. Um, so we are, we, we are behind. I, I think that what we need in the state is, a, a, is, a, is almost a reset and we need to think bold and big. Um, you know, I'll just give you the example of I think it was announced either today or it's going to be announced tomorrow that Scotland is going to uh, is going to put in place a 11 gigawatt offshore wind commitment. They have five five point five million people in their country. We have six million in Maryland. We this is the type of big bold initiative that we need. Um, so that and I mean I was very. Um, very happy to see the governor enter into a partnership with North Carolina and Virginia on the Smart Power uh, Regional Partnership because I think that that helps 
you know, Marilyn re-entering the conversation, but we need to have our own scale here in the state. If you really want the big manufacturing pieces to come to Maryland. Um, at this point, do you know whether there still are plans for like this major backbone down the Atlantic coast? Um, Cause at one time that was also part of the conversation or is it just gonna be each individual developer finds its own transmission lines and runs them directly on shore? The answer is the first 10 gigawatts are probably, um, you know, single lines, but we, we have been convening the developers, the states, the Maryland PSC was part of this conversation to talk about a coordinated uh, grid strategy where we would have an ocean grid. Uh, we just released a white paper on that, which I'm more than happy to send to the committee to, for you all to look at, but we recommend that there is a backbone and, you know, an ocean grid backbone developed because we will be capacity constrained if we don't. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And again, thanks for all the work you've been doing on this, Liz. Thanks. I know you've been really committed. Thank you for your support, Senator. Okay. I've got Chair Kelly and then Senator Klaus Meyer after that. So those are the next two. We want to thank you for being here. And uh, this is all very exciting in terms of the possibilities. Um, what are you doing or what could you do if we were uh, interested in helping uh, to increase jobs here. You mentioned a job fair coming up in February, but tell us a little bit about the criteria and the skill sets that you need. Could the average community college graduate maybe do what you need done? Or would uh, curriculums need to be built here in Maryland? Or do you need baccalaureate level training? What do you need and what could we do? And um, if we gave scholarships to young people to uh, uh, work in your industry, how long might it take to get them up and running uh, and ready to um, give service back? So we need all level of, all skill level of workers. Um, we need, and it, it, it's a multi-pronged approach. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that we need, you know, it would, uh, I would love for us to emulate Tufts University and put a master's of offshore wind in place of, at our University of Maryland system. I mean, we could take we could take people right now that even if they had undergraduate, you know, offshore wind in, in an environmental studies uh, curriculum, we could we could take them now, and we would gladly across the entire industry take them. Um, as we start with the you know the port construction, the onshore construction, and then moving through, you know, manufacturing facilities get established. And then we go into the construction and installation phase. We will need, you know, skilled workers. We'll need, we'll need our labor unions, um, our IBEW high voltage electricians. So we need apprenticeship programs. We need uh, training, uh, technical training, um, as it relates to uh, wind turbine technicians. Those are, you know, mostly, the, you know, the automotive industry. As a as a um, as an automotive technician, you can easily go over into the wind technician. So there, I mean, there's so composites. I mean, there's so many things that we actually need. I could just, you know, I could give you a long list, but I mean, it, it's well, all there. Well that's really helpful to give us a picture. We won't ask you for the long list today. I'd like to accept your offer of our getting the white paper and also whatever your specs are sure. for people into the industry um, and, and um, information about the upcoming um, job fair in February. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Senator Klausmar did have a question, but I'm not sure I see Senator Klausmar. I don't know if we lost Senator Klausmar or- Maybe her question was answered. <laughs> okay, no, she's reconnecting. I see her oh, reconnecting. Okay. Senator Klausmar, uh, I see you. you it is, you've got the floor. Unmute yourself though. You gotta unmute yourself. Okay, we gotta unmute Senator Klausmar. Okay. I got it. I ran out of juice on my battery. Anyway, I just want to, and, and I missed the whole conversation uh, with the chair, 
chairman, but uh, I just want to say thanks to Liz for your tenacity for everything you've done over the years. You never gave up, and I'm glad we are where we are, but I just wish we would have been the first. But, and we would have had all the manufacturing we needed here. So, but, so thank you. We'll get there. Uh, yes, 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 slowly, but surely. Yep, thank you for your support. Senator. Okay, anything I can do, please let me know you know that, so. Right. Uh, Senator Hershey, do you have a question? Senator Hershey, no? Okay. Okay, seeing no further questions, um, thank you to that panel on offshore wind. We're gonna now move to, I think a really important topic having to do with our labor folks and some of the opportunities economically, job-wise. And so um, we've got the first panel is from Leuna and the Baltimore DC Building Trades Council. We've got Rick Benetti from Leuna, uh, Jeff Guido and Melissa Wells uh, from the DC, Baltimore DC Building Trades Council. And Melissa Wells is here. She's our, one of our state delegates, of course, but she's here sort of wearing a different hat today, just to clarify that point on behalf of uh, the Trades Council. So we're gonna start um, with Mr. Benetti. And then when we're done with this panel, we're gonna go to Tom Myers um, uh, to do cleanup uh, as well. But we'll take the, the three here and then we'll open up for questions. Then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, complete the uh, hearing from uh, hearing from Mr. Meyer. So uh, Rick, are you out there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Senator, I am here. Okay, well, you're uh, leading, leading off on behalf of labor. Great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kelly and members of the Finance Committee. Uh, I'm Rick Benetti. I'm here representing the Baltimore Washington Laborers Di uh, District Council. Uh, I'll be super brief on my remarks to give those uh, coming behind me more time to talk about workforce and apprenticeship training uh, because they are, are definitely the experts. But I wanted to make a couple of overall points um, uh, and, and sort of um, so on what Liz just mentioned about sort of a um, sort of a, a a coalition of ideas in terms of, of uh, employment. Um, first, um, I think it's great that finance is so interested in this subject. Uh, the relationship between the environmental and labor communities in Maryland is still evolving. The fact that we're here today proves that the Maryland Senate uh, is taking these issues seriously, however. Just a couple of years ago, I'm not sure we would have uh, had these different interests together to discuss uh, Maryland's labor and energy future. So I wanna thank the committee for their leadership. Uh, but, you know, it, whatever, whatever the form or however long it takes, the transition to greener energy in Maryland has to include a blueprint for the transition, not just of jobs, but of meaningful employment, uh, especially for the craft working trades. Frankly, up to this point, the trades have struggled to have their voice heard um, along these lines in, in, in these matters as it relates to um, the environment and our transition here. Um, these are, you know, as, as you all know, these are these are well-paid, middle-class building, legacy-type jobs that we're talking about here with millions of man hours on the line. They can't just go away without a statewide plan um, because they're so important to the state's economy. These are true middle-class jobs we're talking about here. Um, we know, we know there are not, there's not likely to be the same number of jobs created in the green energy economy as there is in today's energy economy. Uh, we've certainly seen this thus far in Maryland solar, solar industry and um, the jobs that are created there, th these aren't the kind of the career middle-class building jobs that, that are so important for Maryland's workforce, uh, especially in the absence of any, you know, large scale projects that, that have been touched on here. Um, you know, the, it's disappointing uh, where we are in terms of wind energy at this point. Um, and we, we really do need to get some of these utility scale solar projects off the ground. Um, we need to start thinking seriously about utility scale storage projects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in terms of, in terms of pro labor jobs and, 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 and pro middle class jobs, the general assembly has made some strides in terms of including pro labor language in recent legislation last year, CJA bill being the prime example. Uh, and I'm also happy to report that the building trades in the Maryland Geothermal Association have had some really positive discussions um, this over the last few months about possible legislation uh, related to the geothermal industry coming up. Uh, but the state needs to be more. 
to, to the state needs to do more, very frankly. Um, just a few examples. Maryland's got to do more to create real accountability in how it polices uh, the labor policy, uh, labor policies related to how the state spends its capital dollars. Uh, for starters, the prevailing wage unit in the Department of Labor is consistently understaffed, and it doesn't matter who the governor is. This has never been a partisan issue, and it only makes it easier for unscrupulous contractors to continue to win state construction contracts while not paying the kinds of wages the state expects them to pay uh, when they're leveraging those capital dollars to build public infrastructure. Um, other examples, you know, that of, of sort of things we need to think about going forward are the Maryland Stadium Authority, the University of Maryland system, Medco bond and financing used to pay for public infrastructure. These are all exempt from the state's prevailing wage law. And while small in number and in value, there's multiple tax breaks out there to, for Maryland businesses to hire apprenticeships, but they don't have any, these tax breaks don't have any real strings uh, attached to them in terms of pay scale. Um, the largest county in the state, another example, consistently uses 22 to 24% state money to build schools. Um, many other counties do this as well, albeit on a, on a less consistent basis. But this is, this, these are ways for, for, for counties at the local level to get around Maryland's prevailing wage law when it's using capital, the state's capital construction dollars to do so. Um, and while we were able to get legislation passed in the last two years that requires contractors bidding on state construction work to provide a base level of health care, um, um, uh, health care coverage for construction workers, there's a lot more the state can do through its procurement system to incentivize contractors, both big and small, who win state contracts to pay family sustaining wages and quality health care when they hire workers. Um, and finally, you know, the General Assembly should require the Maryland Public Service Commission to consider climate and labor when regulating utilities or helping utilities map out what the transition to green energy looks like. If the PSC, for example, says it's not under their purview, well, that can be easily fixed. So um, while I'm not talking specifically about apprenticeship and, and workforce development, which Jeff and, and Melissa know a lot more about than I do, I just wanted to bring up these issues with the committee because the transition to green energy is simply unlikely to create the amount uh, of legacy jobs the energy industry currently is producing for trade workers. The transition isn't going to be just about swapping one job for another, especially without these uh, large scale utility projects. Uh, and there won't be uh, enough new jobs to, to, to help fill the gap. Um, so if Maryland wants to keep these legacy jobs contributing to the state's economy, it's really, really going to take a, a much larger holistic approach in how the state um, um, uses the, the massive amount of capital investment power it has to create meaningful employment for a really large swath of, of workers um, in the state. So um, I just want to throw that idea out there and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll toss it to my colleagues, uh, Jeff and Melissa. Okay, we'll go, let's go to Jeff Guido and then we'll go to Delegate Wells and then we'll open up for questions. I would note uh, with respect to geothermal, I am working uh, with Delegate Charcutian on the other side on some geothermal legislation that I think uh, will be helpful in this regard. So um, Jeff Guido, uh, you're up next. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman and Chair uh, Kelly. Uh, I'll make a quick statement on the transitioning of workers um, shouldn't be coupled to just a single industry. We need to, uh, you know, labor could support a just transition for any worker that has lost their job due to a change in markets or industry. Um, just the workers at the coal plant are the main ones, but then you have your uh, suppliers, your other people that are involved in the maintenance and all that, they're also going to be affected by the, the shutdown of those plants. Um, so we can work together on that going forward. Um, but as far as our apprenticeship programs going, we are trained very much in the green energy. We do green roofs, geothermal, solar, uh, the thermal skin of the building, rainwater catchment systems, uh, changing over uh, impervious pavement to pervious pavement, which is a huge ongoing project in Prince George's County. Uh, so we're very well involved in the, uh, the green energy and we do train for those jobs. And if there's any need for workers, we have the capacity to train 
and really at no cost to the state. We, we do all of our own, uh, pay for all of our own training through our apprenticeship programs. I think we have uh, 20 or 22 programs in the state. We're spending about 22 million a year on apprenticeship training uh, and more than willing to work with you. I know the Block Island uh, offshore wind was a project labor agreement. And as uh, David uh, Smedic spoke about uh, creating union jobs, the best way to do that is through a project labor agreement. It ensures our contractors have a fair uh, bidding process. And it's also fair to the non-union contractors. They just have to be agreeable to the uh, PLA. They don't have to sign a CBA. Just they work under the PLA agreement terms. Uh, with that, I will let my, uh, my colleague Melissa expand on the apprenticeship training. She seems like she has a nice slide prepared for us. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for the record, I'm Melissa Wells. I'm here today in my capacity as Director of Apprenticeship Readiness and Training for the Baltimore DC Building Trades. Um, thank you to Vice Chair Feldmark and Chairwoman Kelly and to the members of the committee. Um, Tyler, could you start on, or excuse me, Nathan, could you start on slide five for me, please? Um, I think definitely a lot of the, the key context is laid out. We folks had my presentation, so I'm happy to kind of dig deeper into it. But um, I think the, the, the piece that really resonated with me was the remarks made by Liz Burdock around, um, I think the large, you know, we know we have a, a significant labor shortage, skilled labor shortage, which is not just apparently uh, an American problem, but it sounds like it's becoming a global problem. And I think also um, the other piece is really the market conditions that, that exist here in Maryland on um, those conditions, not only for how we do employment and oversight of labor, but also the fact that when we talk about um, this green economy and we talk about you know, a greener utility um, network, we also have to look at the fact that, that that network requires investment in significant infrastructure. So, you know, just thinking about um, Trade Point Atlantic and what they're doing with the staging for offshore wind, well, that's possible because they have access to the harbor, they have access to a rail network. And so when you look at um, south of us in Virginia, they're making those investments in infrastructure that Maryland is not making. And so even when we have the conversation about the blueprint, we also have to make sure that that blueprint is looking at the broader network of, of transportation, if it's for rail, which we are making strides on in Maryland, but also making sure that, that those investments in rail, that's part of the green economy, right? So how do we make sure that we're attaching um, pieces around utilization of apprentices on those projects? And so I think that we have to look at every opportunity that we make any capital investments, if it's on school construction, um, if it's on transportation and rail, we, I, we have to make sure that there's some clear guidelines around apprenticeship utilization. And the biggest thing around, you know, I have questions, so my job is to have these, these conversations with how do we prepare our high school students, adults, unemployed, folks that, are, that have historically been underemployed, how do we prepare them for these jobs and get them trained? And really, you have to always be doing it. And I think that oftentimes the conversation happens as we're having these huge projects that are coming on board, but technically there's a pipeline of work that we've completely missed the opportunity to connect for training, right? And so we really have to create a market in Maryland where we're mindful mindful that we have prevailing wage and there are standards around using apprenticeship, but we have no standard in the state of Maryland that says you have to use apprentices, right? A certain percentage of apprentices. We also know that there's different, um, there's contractors that are, that are part of apprenticeship programs and, and they continue to invest and work with um, various sponsorship, be they union or non-union. And then you have contractors that are not at all really making a committed investment in apprenticeship and training. And the apprenticeship is the biggest on-ramp for anyone to become a skilled tradesman or woman, for them to also move up, um, up if they wanna become an estimator, you learn that on the job. A lot of folks become member owners. And so there's a pathway that exists there. Next slide. Um, so I'm kind of moving around a little bit, but we do invest about 24 million annually. Next slide. Um, and you can kind of keep going. So just, to, just so folks can see the network, we have a robust network of training. The, this is, this is just the union training. So there's other programs out there, but just for the Baltimore DC building trade, if you look on here, we have programs in Southern Maryland, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, uh, Prince George's, 
um, even some that serve DC that are really on the on the DC Maryland border. So that that network exists. So for that reason, it's important that we're having the conversations. And these these programs are managed are jointly managed with the union, and they're also managed with the 1,200 plus contractors who are the employers. So for all apprenticeships. An apprenticeship is on the job training. So if you don't have an employer, you don't have an apprenticeship, a registered apprenticeship program, because those employers, they're the ones that help the apprentices meet the, the work hours that are required for them to meet, for them to complement that with their classroom education. Um, so we have that we have that network that exists here, and that network is working with the schools, is working with the um, workforce investment boards and other partners as well. So we should make sure that when we're having the conversation, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, bring the building trades um, to the table to help kind of craft this conversation from an economic and contracting piece standpoint and also to the training and to the worker piece. Next slide. Um, so we do, one of the biggest things that we, we know that historically, um, a, lot of, a lot of families that used to be connected with labor, a lot of, a lot of them, their children have gone on to, do, to work in different industries. So we're really focusing on identifying, going back into the schools, going to communities that haven't always had access to the trades, recruiting women, veterans, um, people of color, making sure that this next generation of, of, of workers looks like the communities that are reflected here in Maryland and reflected in the communities where you live. Um, and so we do the pre-apprenticeship as a way to provide a stepping stone. And I think that a lot of times there's a lot of effort put on, you know, doing this program and that program. It does not take a lot for someone to be prepared to enter the construction industry. But what they really need more so than a lot of pre-apprenticeship or, you know, workforce programs, they need a steady pipeline of projects that they can be, that they can be attached to. And so we're a multi-employer, which means, I know people say construction is temporary, but it's a project-based industry. So I try to get people to stop saying temporary and call it a project-based industry. We have enough projects here in Maryland. We have enough projects within the mid, the mid Atlantic region that are accessible in DC and Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, that people can have a fulfilling, career in construction that they can, you know, I could go into a program today and I could be successful if I have access to that pipeline. So what we want to be doing is um, if we go, I think to like slide nine or 10, I get a little bit more into it, but we really have to understand, you can keep going, um, Nathan, um, keep going. What we really have to understand is that we need to be, we need to be looking at um, the supply chain and those contractors in the supply chain and who are, are they a part of an apprenticeship program? If they aren't, why aren't they a part of an apprenticeship program? Any person who says we need more skilled labor and after that doesn't come for supporting apprenticeship program is not really looking for a solution to this problem. You have to get trained and you can't just get trained overnight. You can't get trained a year, you know, a week before. Um, I think Liz kind of talks about the different levels of skill that's required. So we should be seeing over time, we should not be saying, oh, well, we don't have enough. We should be seeing the skill level of, of Maryland skilled um, building and construction trades. We should continue to see that skill level increasing and increasing and increasing over time if we have all this work and we have people that are in programs providing a revolving door of training, you know, becoming licensed or certified, and then, you know, you go on and you move through your career. Um, so if you go to, I think, the, the second to last slide, um, I think the biggest thing is that when we talk about apprenticeship and expansion, we have to uh, understand that it's the employers who are the contractors that are, they really are important to make sure we're on the same page about using apprentices, about providing that skill that is not just using them, um, you know, for, for a little bit, but providing access to a network where they can get the skill and training and the increase in their skill and training as well as their wages. And we also, Rick mentioned this, but we have to really get to the oversight and enforcement and penalties. Um, that is a big problem here in Maryland. And if we don't do that, we're going to continue to have a, a, a pool or market where there's people who can continue to use apprentices or use Maryland workers and then basically, um, you know, get the work and qualify and then move on and go on to the next project and leave that person high and dry. In Baltimore City, I see it here, Prince George's, other parts of the state, it's happening. So, um, and then I think the last slide, just the conclusion, that may have been it. But so that, I know I said a lot, um, there's, there's, it's, it's complicated, but it's not complicated. I think that make, ensuring that you have um, 
the training providers at the table who are connected with the employers is, a, is an important, I think, aspect of the construction industry. So with that, I will uh, cede my time. Thank you. Okay, well, th thank you, Delegate Wells, and to the panel. Um, I do see questions from Senator Klausmeyer and then Senator Augustine. So Senator Klausmeyer, you're first, but you gotta unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Now, um, Melissa, uh, um, is the heating and frosting, is that heating and air conditioning? Just like? No, that's the um, the asbestos workers and they do they do insulation of, of pipes that way that, you know, keeps the- Okay, keeps all right. Temperature, yeah. I have in my district and I'm sure many other folks do and they do not have union jobs but heating and air conditioning, we always need those folks. And they're small businesses for the most part. Uh, and they have come to me and asked for apprenticeship programs. And I think uh, Vice Chair Feldman has been through that as well after you passed your bill last year that, or two years ago, that we're, we're having trouble getting apprenticeship programs for them because they don't fit into union-based apprenticeship programs. And that goes into the, that, that bill. So I don't know if any way you can help me or give me some suggestions and you don't have to do it right now, but we can talk. And I, I just think, uh, as I said, I have like three within walking distance of my house, three small businesses and they're not union, but they're small businesses. So. Mm -hmm. If you can think of any way we can help them, I'd appreciate it. So we can we can talk about it. I mean, if you think of okay. the model as a like a a conglomerate of people coming together, pulling their money together to pay for it. So it actually is conducive for smaller businesses that need to be able to um, expand and contract their labor quickly, but also be able to to pull resources to not have to make the investment. There may be another conversation to be had with those businesses about. Um, how successfully their bidding work and what type of work they are bidding and what type of work that they're getting, which we can have a conversation about. Okay. But I, I just know that, um, and I hate to say this uh, while we're talking unions and all, but ABC has had a, 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 an apprenticeship program with heating and air conditioning. And I, I don't know if it's still in existence or not, but I just think we need to have that conversation. So maybe you and we I do have, just to be clear, um, we do have the, there are union um, a heating program. So in Baltimore, we have 486, we have a steam fitter 602 in, in Prince George's, and we also have um, the plumbers and gas fitters local five. Uh, the issue though, I will say this is that a lot of times the, the conditions in, in Maryland are not always um, we need to improve those market conditions because I will say that we get a lot more work in Virginia and DC than we do in Maryland. And so I've had people that I train in our Baltimore program who go to Virginia to work on, on projects, who go to DC to work on projects or folks in Prince George's who want to work in Prince George's. I work with the, the school system there and with different programs and they're going to Virginia and DC as well. So there again, the conversation about market conditions has to really be the underlying kind of the focus of this when we talk about the transition because you can transition but if the market is providing a space where those good union jobs pretty much are the last of those union jobs then we need to understand why those jobs have gone why they've gotten weaker and also how we make sure that we're creating more market conditions for this new um, you know, this new uh, green clean energy process that we're that we're approaching right well, now. Well, uh, as I said, the, the, the folks are in very small businesses and they need help. And uh, it's not a big thing that they, they need help, real okay. help in sure. all, all kinds of different ways. So, but I, I'm going to give the young lady your name and she can talk to you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Senator Augustine. Sorry, Senator Augustine, I was muted. Senator Augustine. <clears throat> now, thank you very much. Um, and I just want to say that I, I really appreciate how as a committee we've brought together the 
green energy jobs um, and just get green energy, which is so important. It's an important priority that we have and that we also have the priority of jobs and jobs that will support families. So I think that that is something that is, I'm so glad that we've brought these two things together. What, what is of interest to me is what do the, um, what do the building trade unions think that we need to do if there is anything that we need to do legislatively to further strengthen those connections and you know, such that we do see uh, more of an uptake on some of these programs and the apprenticeships and things like that. I don't know who's- I answer that to, uh, yeah, to, to Jeff Guido or Rick I, yeah, yeah. I thought Jeff yeah. had retired, but um, sure, since Jeff is still around, we oh, definitely want Jeff I'm to- semi, <laughs> semi in there. Uh, so, one thing that has to take place is when the, you put out a request for proposal, the specifications, the building specifications have to state that we're going to have solar panels, green roofs, the geothermal that you build to those specifications. And that will open up those jobs and opportunities for the apprenticeships and the contractors. But if they don't state it specifically, they're gonna bid the project to what's in those documents. So any public works that go out should include uh, that language and their specifications. And then you'll get a greener project and more greener jobs uh, because of it. So that's help. That Thank you, I appreciate that. And that is, that's very helpful. Just to add, I think the other thing though too is um, these conversations also need to happen at the local level because we know a lot of the capital investment projects that, that we are seeing do take place and are um, procured by the counties or the cities or municipals. And so as much as we're pushing the conference, and I know that this is happening, we do have to also look at locally um, in whatever county that you represent on Prince George's um, that that they're also doing the same thing, you know, if it's with school construction or what have you, so that we do have to be moving to two pathways, have to be moving at the same time. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mr. Vice, hey, one yes, last uh, hand, Senator sure. Benson. Okay, Senator Benson, I didn't see, I didn't see your hand, but Senator Benson. You gotta unmute yourself, Senator. Yeah, unmute yourself. Hey, thank Senator. you. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, for a number of years, we've been talking about apprenticeships uh, as it pertains to uh, uh, persons who are incarcerated, who are returning back uh, to their communities. Um, and we've heard today about uh, the, the problems of, um, of um, the, um, the uh, from the Sierra Club about labor and and the shortage of employees. And we've also heard about the workshop that's going to take place uh, relative to employing people uh, to work. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what happened with the uh, apprenticeship programs that were in our institutions. Are we, is that still strong? And can we use, can we use this program, the apprenticeship program when we talk about clean energy, when we're talking about construction, and I have to tell you all, I'm just a little concerned of the public-private partnership that's going to take place with uh, the building of the schools. I'm just wondering whether or not <coughs> uh, we are we are protecting the workers, but also preparing the young people who are coming out of the correctional in, uh, facilities uh, to to take on these some of these high skill jobs. Can you speak to that? Maybe sure. any of the uh, presenters who are still with us uh, could take that on. I know we've been trying to broker conversations with Department of Corrections. Uh, I believe there, there are some programs there. Uh, the building trades we do nationally, we are actually the partner, training partner for all of California and will be in all their correctional facilities by the end of, I think by next June. So we have curriculum to do that. We are working with high schools. We um, have a program that we're doing right now at Woodlawn High School in Baltimore County. Also, um, we are doing a program with um, High Point High School in Prince George's County 
uh, DC, that's not relevant, but still an example. So we are doing programming with high schools. Um, I think the biggest challenge when it comes to high school students though is um, our students, they really just need to have a good grasp of math. Um, they have to, you know, I think we can do more to kind of fuel in a creative way their interest in the, the construction trade, which is becoming more virtual. The technology is, is changing, which in a way that appeals to young people. But um, I think the other challenge that still remains is um, a lot of folks when we leave high school, they don't have transportation. <laughs> and so getting to the jobs that, that the apprenticeships are part of is still a bit of a challenge um, for us that we're seeing. But, but I'm happy to talk more with you, Senator Benson, about what we can do and um, the things we're seeing that are working and where we know we can, there needs to be more improvement. And yeah, we're talking about, we're talking about the solar, the solar industry and all the opportunities that are available. It seems to me that we would want to, to uh, talk to the correctional facilities in the great state of Maryland to work with these persons that are coming back to the community. Because one of the big problems that causes the recidivism to take place is that these people come out of the correctional facilities. They don't have the skills to work. There's no promise. And they end up going back, getting into this, in, into trouble. We, we, you know, we've got to do something about this problem here. The, 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 uh, if we're talking about uh, the, the, uh, the, the programs that uh, were discussed today, I think that that might be one avenue we want to explore. I'm just a little more interested in knowing uh, also about uh, the um, if they're going to you're going to have a um, the, the, well I don't want to talk about that. So let me just let me be quiet. Okay, we're glad that everybody is so wow. interested. And we've had excellent presenters. I think we've learned. Wow. A, we have one more. Chair, yes, Chair Kelly, we have, you know, don't want to cut them because we do have one more witness. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to think that we, okay. uh, we've got Tom Myers here from the International Brotherhood Electrical Workers Local uh, 26. He's going to, Chair Kelly, he's going to be our cleanup today, but I didn't Thank want you. to uh, forget he's an important uh, part of this discussion. So absolutely, uh, Myers, I, um, I turn it over to you to, again, play cleanup uh, for, for today. Uh, you've got to unmute yourself or somebody's got to unmute you. There. No, I, I should have unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah. We're good now. We're good I now. apologize. Um, my, every time you switch screens, my computer reboots for some reason. It's never happened before. That's what took so long. Um, yeah. I'd like to uh, thank Chair Kelly and Vice Chair Feldman and all the participants uh, for having this conversation. Uh, I, I got to be completely honest with you. I was kind of uh, asked to do this at the last moment. Um, so my PowerPoint might not be as pretty as the other people's uh, PowerPoints, but um, I, I think the information is valid. If you can move to the next slide. All right, so just so you know who I am, um, I'm the president of IBW Local 26, and we represent about 9,500 electricians directly. Um, and then we're associated with the IBW International, 700,000 plus electricians across the country and in Canada. Our CISLA locals in the area uh, will be 24, local 24 up in Baltimore, 70, which is alignment, 307, 410, which is utilities, 1370, 1718, 1900, and a few more. And they are directly affected by the closure of these uh, coal plants. Now, 1900 is more affected by anybody than anybody else because that's who they represent. But my fellows, the guys in 20 and the guy in 70, they, they get affected by it as well. We represent inside electricians, which you would consider the people that wire buildings in hospitals and schools, utility electricians, they're the ones that work at the utility plants themselves, linemen, railroad workers, and a whole litany of other people. Um, we have apprentices, um, apprenticeships um, across that wide range of job descriptions. Um, I'm specifically um, knowledgeable in the inside wireman world because that's what I am. Um, I was an apprentice instructor for 10 years before I moved up to the presidency of the local. Um, and I want to make it very clear that if you would like to have more people involved in the trades, learning the trades, the simplest and most effective thing that any legislature can do is to provide for a very simple process by which PLAs are approved that any and all government money spent on buildings will require some sort of PLA so that the money that the state spends out of its treasuries is going to go back to workers in the state. 
Local 26 and most of the locals out there do not charge for their um, training. Uh, we don't take any money from the state. If you want me to have a thousand apprentices, well, okay, 3,000 because I already have a thousand. If you want me to have 3,000, I need more work. The only thing holding the organized trades back from employing more people and training more people is the ability to secure jobs for our contractors. That is the single most important thing and that it hasn't been said. So I'm going to go back to my thing, but I wanted to make sure. Um, Senator Benson, I'd also like to point out that the trades do not um, discriminate against people with felonies. I have people in my apprenticeship now that are convicted of felonies and they come in and we tell them that it's not a problem to come in and get trained. It's not a problem to become an again an electrician. All right. The problem is, is sometimes the jobs we work on are high security jobs and having that on their record would obviously keep them out of it. But that doesn't stop them from building a school. That doesn't stop them from building a hospital. It doesn't stop them from becoming an apprentice and working in any number of the jobs that we have out there. And the more jobs we have, the more jobs that the state can secure for us, the more apprentices we can take in from all walks of life, male, female, uh, minority, non-minority, uh, doesn't matter who they are. My apprenticeship is about as diverse as the community can possibly get. Uh, and we're proud of that and we strive for that. All right. Uh, I just wanted to mention that. Could you go to the next slide, please? All right. So I did a little bit of research and I'm only highlighting the yellow stuff here. Um, we were talking about green energy and that's what I was told about the energy capacity of the state of Maryland. I want to make it clear that 38% of the state's utility that is produced here comes from Calvert Cliffs. All right. That's a nuclear power facility. All right. Maryland ranks about 10 with the lowest per capita natural gas use. That's also another kind of clean energy. It's not cleanest and certainly not solar. But the thing about it is, is somebody mentioned it earlier, uh, the capacity to store energy. Solar is only working when the sun is up. And I know everybody's heard it and everybody's tired of hearing it, but it's a fact. And wishing it to be something else is not going to change it. The reason that you need coal power plants and the reason you need nuclear power plants and the reason you need gas powered plants is because wind doesn't work all the time and solar doesn't work all the time. Now that can be fixed. I want to be clear about that with an investment in the infrastructure. If you have storage capacity, which hasn't been developed on that large scale yet, you can absolutely make that transition. I want to be clear about that. All right. Maryland has increased its portfolio standard to require 50% of the state's electrical sales be generated from renewable sources. Today, about 11% of the total, total energy generation comes from renewables. Now, there's, there's a little trick in that language there. Electricity sales be generated from renewable. So if that's followed, it's kind of helpful because as it sits right now, Maryland only produces about 50% of the power that it consumes. If you go to the next slide. All right. So this came straight from uh, the Department of Energy. Uh, it was a report that was done early this year. All right, so Maryland, about almost 6 million people. All right, electrical power consumption, 61.8 terawatt hours. That's a unit of energy consumption, all right? The electrical power generation in Maryland, 37.8 terawatt hours. So you can do the math yourself. It's a little bit less than, a little bit more than half. All right, where does this energy come from? Well, you got coal, petroleum, natural gas, nuclear, hydro, and other renewables. And there's another thing I want to point out. That 11% that we talked about earlier includes hydropower. On this particular chart, it is, you know, cut out. Hydro is sit, situated up by itself. The renewable energy infrastructure in Maryland has not made it to the point where it can make up for uh, a sustained closure of all the power plants, all, excuse me, all the coal burning power plants. And uh, Senator Hershey, I believe it was you who asked about the brownouts. Well, let me explain to you how brownouts work. All right. If at any point you turn on your air conditioner, what that does is it creates demand from the grid. Now, the grid is fed by power plants from all over the region. You've got power plants down in, you know, in Pennsylvania and Ohio and West Virginia and in Maryland that are pushing energy AC power onto the grid. So when you turn on your air conditioner, you're creating a demand. Now, it's a very small demand, so it doesn't make any difference. But when 6 million people turn on their air conditioner, that creates a very big demand. All right. If we don't have the ability to sustain the grid, two, one of two things happens. Either you have brownouts where the, the voltage is not clean enough and they turn off the power at the locality, 
or they intentionally turn off. And you've all seen this with pg e in the area. Hey, when the power is, you know, the demand or the heat is very high, they'll turn off the power to your air conditioner and they'll give you a little bit of a rebate so that they can have the power for the hospitals and schools and the businesses. And then later on that day, they'll turn it back on and they've saved a little bit of money or you've saved a little bit of money and they have not had to do anything to increase the capacity because they turn off the power to the places that they believe don't need it. And usually that's going to be in sleeper neighborhoods like the one I'm living in right now because I'm at work. Well, what about the people who aren't at work? Okay. What about the schools in those areas? Well, they don't get the turn off. When you destabilize the grid to the point where that doesn't work anymore, they turn off whole communities. Simple as that. They turn them off for a period of time and then they move it to the next one. That's why it's called a rolling brownout. A blackout is a, is a sudden catastrophic, they turn it off. That can be caused by not having enough power either. Not having enough power increases the temperature of the lines on the transmission lines. It causes them to swell and because they're hung between two poles, they sag. They hit a tree and it causes a blackout. You might remember the one back in like 2008 or whatever. So the point I'm trying to make here is we are reducing the amount of energy that we are taking from coal. Solar and wind can help with peak production because when do you want your air conditioner on? You know, it's August. The sun is shining. The sun's at its peak in June. We're producing a lot of power and that helps. Turn the sun off, or excuse me, the sun goes down. I'm just talking vernacular. The sun goes down and there is no AC power going on to the grid. So in order to be able to use that energy, I would have to have it stored somewhere. You cannot store AC power in any capacity. AC power is used at the point it's created. Think of the grid as a great big pressurized balloon. All the power production facilities pump power onto it, and all the loads, the buildings, the hospitals, the schools, the houses, the streetlights, and everything, they pull power off, and the engineers and the, the facilities have to maintain that balance. It can go up or down a little bit, but a major screw-up is going to cause problems. But I wanted to be very clear about that. We only produce half the power that we consume. So the power is coming from somewhere. So we shut down all our plants, all our coal-burning plants, and I know we have a 2030 goal, and I, I hope and I believe we can meet it if we all work together. Um, but that power is going to come from somewhere. Is it going to come from Pennsylvania? Is it going to come from Ohio? Is it going to come from West Virginia? Is it going to come from the wind turbines off the coast? I hope to God it does. But if it's coming from Pennsylvania, any legislation you do in Maryland isn't going to change the output of Pennsylvania. If they need to sell that power, they're going to sell it and they're going to use whatever energy they need to do to sell it. Could you go to the next slide, please? All right, so I did this little math here. Uh, this all comes from, and if you move, I don't know if you can see it, but um, I have the link if anybody wants to look on it because it goes all the way back to 1970, I believe. I just used 2000, 2010, and the most recent year, 2019. Uh, so on the right-hand side of the screen there, you'll see that in 2000, uh, total production uh, was 51 uh, 51 million megawatt hours, okay? You, you can see it right up there at the top, total electrical production. In 2010, the total production is down 40 to 43. In 2019, it's down to 39. Um, our use hasn't dropped by that much. It's, you know, more people, more energy efficiency, so it's kind of about the same. Total production in coal, if you'll notice, there has been a major drop in the use of coals for the production of megawatt hours. 23 million fewer megawatt hours produced by coal. Talking about solar, the difference in 2000, it was not measurable for the purposes of this study, according to what they said. That's why it's not even on that list. All right, 2010, it was 80 megawatt hours. 2019, it was 494,311 megawatt hours. Now I want you to compare that number to the difference in the drop in the capacity of coal. Have we made up that difference someplace else that I can't find? I don't know. I do know that we can. The investment that needs to be made in solar, in wind, in biomass, in wood and wood-derived fuels, you get the point, is important. And we have to make sure that those jobs that are being lost because we're shutting down these plants aren't just being shipped off to Pennsylvania because they're willing to keep burning coal. This is a national crisis. It's actually a global crisis that we're trying to respond to in a state. It needs to be reacted to on a 
federal level and on a global level. Uh, when Biden gets in in January 20, as you said, uh, Vice Chair Feldman, uh, things may change. And I, heard, I certainly hope they, they change for the better and that there's a massive investment in the infrastructure and that gigawatts worth of power off the coast is, in, is installed. And I will work with everybody and anybody to make sure that the training is available for those people. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is just one to let you know. I'm, uh, I put this up there when I thought we were actually talking about just coal. Um, but the point is Maryland is down 40% from coal use from 2019 to 20. We are dropping like a rock with coal production. What I don't want to see happen is those, you know, those guys working in the plants, you know, y'all, everybody's talking about the young worker. Everybody's talking about the, the 22 year olds who've made a few mistakes. He needs to get a good high paying job. Yes, he does. But what about that 55 year old who's been working in that plant for the last 30 years and he's only four or five years away from retirement. You're going to pull that rug out from underneath them. Oh, we're going to provide him with some sustenance. Oh, you're going to pay, you're going to pay his pension benefits for those three years. You're going to pay his uh, annuities. This is a huge economic strain on these gentlemen and these women. We can actually do better. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, the, if you look at this slide right here, I was actually pretty happy to see this. You know, if you take a look at solar electric generation, that's the biggest bar on the job. And this is for actual jobs, breakdown of technology by application. And in the solar industry, the job growth or the jobs created is much greater than in wind, is much greater in high, but that's because of the small scale solar jobs out there done by the, the, the we call them trunk slammers. Uh, I have a couple of them in my, my union. We have them coming up from Texas. We have them coming in from Virginia. Anywhere that, where the money is right, they come in, they do the job, but they all get reported. Now, I wanna be clear about what I said earlier. The renewable energy portfolio in this state only represents 11% of the state's net energy generation, electrical generation. And going back to that we only produce half of what we need, the growth that we need is to meet that 50% is going to be very large. All right, I don't want to cut our noses off to spite our face. Just because um, uh, some people would like to see the, the world changed overnight doesn't mean that it can happen. It will happen, it needs to happen, but it happens on a timetable, it needs to happen. I apologize for being so aggressive. I, I was biting my tongue for a lot of the uh, presentations. It needs to happen on a schedule, a time schedule that is thought out carefully with all the parties being recognized, not just the people who are trying to make money in solar, not just the people who are trying to make money in coal, but for all parties. That's the state's role in this and hopefully the federal government's role. You guys have the ability to maneuver this in such a way that it helps the entire state, not just a small portion of it. Of that 11%, solar provided 33% of the total renewable production. That's out of that 11%, less than half of that 11%, which is you know a low number, is from them. Wind did 12%. And honestly, when they get that those uh, offshore wind things going, that number is going to jump up fast. Next slide, please. All righty, energy efficiency. Now, you guys were talking about the different trades, all right? This chart right here comes from that same report made by Mar uh, for the report of the state of Maryland. Energy Star and Efficiency Lighting, traditional HVAC, Senator Bent, uh, whoever was talking about the uh, air conditioning. All right, that's them. Uh, high efficiency, renewable heating and cooling, um, advanced materials for installation and others, okay? All of those are jobs that if we invest the money of the state of Maryland and this country of the United States properly, all right, those jobs, will create trade opportunities. Now, what trade? Are we talking about low paying, you know, trunk slammer jobs? Or are we talking about head of household, middle income jobs that are generationally transformative? I am an example of that, all right? My father was a bus driver in New York City. There was no opportunity for me to go to college, none whatsoever. I started working at the airlines at the age of 18 and I got into the union at the age of 26, I now, I'm doing very well for myself, all right? I cannot express to you enough how important it is for all of the senators on this, you know, call to recognize that this is a generational transforming event. 
If somebody gets into a, a trade, a unionized trade job, if they choose to let it, it becomes a stepping stone for their children to go to college. I have enough money in my bank account right now to help my children go to the University of Maryland. They will not have to be in debt. So their, their kids are going to do better. That only happens when you have union wages, union benefits, and union opportunities. Back to this slide right here. Construction is 52,910 of these new jobs or the jobs here. That's what the trades do. As the need for retrofitting and newer construction increases, those trades, our trades, all of them, stand ready to implement these actions. What you, when you guys make your legislation, and uh, Brother Guido already said this, you have the ability to require, before any building gets permitted, or before any state building gets built, that, hey, they got to use geothermal. Hey, they have to use high-efficiency technologies. Hey, they have to use solar. Hey, they have to be near enough to um, a transmission line, you know, or not, not the buildings, but any grids, any um, solar farms have to be near enough to something that they can be easily put back onto the grid. That's the problem with transmission. You know, uh, somebody was asking earlier, and, and I'm not an expert on, you know, that level of it. I've built a bunch of solar farms, or not a bunch of solar farms. I've built a bunch of solar in installations, and I've designed quite a few. Um, it takes about 10 acres to have one megawatt worth of power of, of panels. That's why it's out on these. How much, where can you find, you know, 100 acres, you know, to do 10 megawatts of power? Where can you find 1,000 acres to do 100 megawatts in Prince George's County? Or do the math, I might be, you know, just riffing right there. But the point being is they need large pieces of land that is relatively cheap to make it profitable. You're not going to put up, you know, a 100 megawatt, you know, system in downtown D.C. You're certainly not going to do it in Annapolis. The property values are too high. All right. If the legislator of the state of Maryland decides that they want to absolutely push this thing forward, I believe, and I certainly know that the IBW believes, that we believe in an every possible method approach. Yes, we need solar. Yes, we need wind. Yes, we need efficiency. Yes, we need to make sure that the new construction has all of these requirements involved. Solar alone does not fix your problem. Wind alone does not fix your problem. And since uh, we we're talking to the senators, some of the problems we're talking about have little to nothing to do with energy. We're just going to piggyback on the energy problem to create jobs and opportunities for people. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, for solar to become a dominant force in the electrical energy consumption and wind for that matter, um, pro production must increase. Transmission issues must be overcome. Um, and those transmission issues are what I believe is, I forget what the gentleman's name is, but he was 100% right. Um, a lot of the land out there that everybody sees is wide open is just not close enough to the transmission area um, to make it feasible. Uh, I have to be clear, close enough to an AC transmission power line, and then I have, to trans, I have to change the DC voltage created by the sun, turn it into AC, transform it to the proper level, put it onto the grid, and now it's going to be consumed. Uh, did we move forward or back? Go back one. Uh, storage is the other one I wanted to talk about. Um, if you want solar to become the, the savior, uh, we're going to need to invest in storage. You cannot have a conversation about solar at night unless you have storage. Solar is good for peak performance because during the, when the sun is up, it's producing power, and that's what the, so, the coal plants don't have to produce. All of those little panels that you see all around the neighborhoods and everywhere else, they're producing power that doesn't need to be produced by the coal burning plants. So you don't have to run them as often. It's working. It absolutely is working. It's just not working fast enough and on a large enough scale. And to make it work on that level, it will require an investment by some entity on a very large level. I, I'm afraid it's only going to be done on the federal level. We can, we can play around and we can push the words around but until somebody's ready to invest billions of dollars, it will never be the final answer. Next slide, please. So one of the things I looked up is, you know, what are the wind trades and, and the solar trade? What is everybody talking about is the problem for the workforce? And, and there's the numbers right there. 28% um, in electrical power generation, and actually for both power and transmission, say it's very difficult to find the people. 
61% are saying that it's, you know, somewhat difficult. And then other people, not at all. If they're, if they're saying it's not at all difficult, it's because they're not trying to hire anybody. Uh, what are the problems that they're seeing? Lack of experience, training, or technical skills. Experience and training comes from, guess what? Jobs. All right. I can't take somebody, and I actually had a conversation in, in Virginia a couple of years back where they were trying to turn an apprenticeship into a two. I can't turn anybody into a qualified electrician in two years. Nobody can. I can turn them into a helper. I can turn them into a house wire, somebody who wires just residences and homes, and that's a respectable career, but that's not going to get you the $100,000 a year job. I'm going to butt in for just a minute. We schedule this for, we bought a certain amount of time over oh, okay. amount. Case, we don't want to run out. Let me help you out there. In that okay. case, uh, I want to make this last statement. The unionized trades believe in an all above action, renewable energy, efficiency, retrofitting existing buildings, meeting the needs of the Maryland consumer and energy self-sufficiency of the state. Uh, the IBW believes in all of that. And we need the assistance of the legislatures of the states and of the federal government to ensure that when this money gets spent, that it gets spent in such a way that it benefits the people who it's supposed to benefit. And that's the workers. If COVID has taught us anything. The guy sitting at the top of the pyramid at you know, one of the electrical contractors is not the one sitting in there running the pipe in the COVID world. Uh, everybody needs to recognize the value of labor, not the necessity for it, not the integrity of it, but the value of labor. I spent 30 years of my life working outdoors making money for other people, and I have no problem with it. The legislators of the state of Maryland and in the country need to recognize the monetary value of labor, and they need to make that an important part of their decision-making process. And with that, if you've got any questions, hit it. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if we have, we have Senator Kramer has raised his hand. Okay. We have Maybe time to get him under the cap. Minute. We'll take that, that one question. I'll, okay, I'll Senator very, Kramer. I'll be very quick. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you for the presentation. Good stuff. And I apologize if I missed it. My, 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 just a quick question. If the coal plants in Maryland were closed, is there a specific number of workers that will be impacted? Uh, do you know what that figure is? I, and if I missed it, I apologize, but I, I didn't pick not up. Not at all. Um, it, uh, if, if all of them were closed, it would be in excess of seven or 800 directly affected. But then you would have the people who are driving the coals in, you know, the coal in, the truck drivers, the ancillary jobs around it, the managers, the, the cleaning staff. So it, would it be 20,000 people? No, absolutely not. Uh, will it be 50 people? No. But the important thing to take away from this is the direct job losses are head of household jobs where they can send their kids to college, where they have good benefits, they aren't a burden to the state, uh, and they're looking forward to a retirement. So, no, I don't have the exact number, but I can get that from you from 1900. No, that would be great, and I apologize. I, I couldn't know what you said 100 or 700. I, I, it didn't come through for me. Uh, directly, if all the power, all the coal-burning plants closed, it would be in excess of 500. Oh, in excess of 500. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I got. Madam Chair, do you want to close it out? Uh, well, I'll just say thanks to everybody. Uh, we've learned a lot. You've raised some questions. We know we've got more homework to do. And why don't you, Mr. Vice Chair, since you chair our subcommittee in this regard, close it out? Yeah, well, all I would say is, look, I, I, th I think this topic of energy policy and the transition is hugely, hugely important you know, to our state. Also the economic opportunities for the state. But I think on the, the last panel, the workforce uh, component of this, I think is, I think um, Sarah Augustine, I thought, I thought put it well, you know, between the environmental community in conjunction with labor, I think this is a great, hopefully, you know, a partnership. I mean, a lot of states, the two groups work pretty closely together. That's not been the history necessarily the last few years in Maryland, but I'm hoping we can change that paradigm a little bit you know, to get to some win-win solutions where it's good for labor, good for the work, you know, workforces that you represent, but also good for climate change and, and economic development, all that stuff. So Madam Chair, that's really, I think was the point of today's uh, briefing. And I think uh, this was good, um, a good thing to do for the committee. And, and let me also say that on all those fronts, in terms of the future of Maryland, the Senate Finance Committee will be, I think, being 
and central uh, to where Maryland goes on, on these important, important topics. So um, Madam Chair, that's all I have to say um, in closing. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks to all of our speakers and thanks committed uh, for all of your insights and all of your great questions. Thanks to our staff also. Thank you everybody and have a good Thanksgiving. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.